I'm Dr. Stainback, and I want to thank uh, all, all of you in the audience for joining me for this live on-demand webinar. This is an overview of the ASE's new guideline document on echocardiography and the management of patients with LVADs. It was my great privilege to serve as the chair of the guidelines writing committee. I have no financial relationships with industry to disclose. I'd like you to know that the document is available in the August 2015 issue of the Journal of the American Society of Echocardiography. In addition, you can download a PDF of the guidelines document from the ASE's website or in the resources section. Uh, and this is free of charge. I also wanted to just start out with my own housekeeping issue. This is designed to be an overview of the guidelines. This is a relatively new area. And to get through this, I'd like to go through the material somewhat quickly in the interest of time, but I just wanted to remind you that if you feel that it's going too quickly or you're not having enough time at each slide, just remember that this is available online. You'll have a, a, free, you'll have a PDF of the slides that, that we're showing today. There's also several live webinars or uh, other durable educational products online that go into more details on the physiology of continuous flow VADs and also details of how to obtain certain imaging uh, uh, views in these patients. Uh, and also all of the information comes directly from the guidelines document. And so I hope this will serve as an encouragement for you to sit down with the document and read through it further. There are some areas that I really won't I have time to go into, particularly some of the appendix items. The learning objections, uh, objectives uh, for the talk are to describe the current FDA-approved surgically implanted long-duration LVADs. Also, that you be able to list the five distinct phases of care in which ECHO is used for LVAD patient management. And to be able to locate within the LVAD guideline the pertinent echo exam protocol and safety concerns associated with each phase of care. And to recognize the most important echo features of normal and abnormal LVAD function. One question that I get asked from time to time is why is the document really even needed at this point, and even more frequently, I get asked, why has it taken so long to have a document? Uh, so, because this is a new uh, guideline area, I think some background information for a historical perspective is in order before diving right into the current recommendations. Mechanical circulatory support's been under active development for 40 years, and there seem to be three eras when it comes to surgically implanted devices for circulatory support. This first era lasted for 20 years, beginning in the mid-1970s, with the first generation pulsatile LVADs being reported in tr clinical trials really not until the early 1990s. And I punctuate this area with 1994, which is when the first patient actually left the hospital with a first-generation LVAD. From an echo perspective, uh, at that time, mechanical circulatory support really was just background noise, but not a real part of clinical operations except for at a few centers. But the second era started in around uh, the mid-'90s um, and lasted for 15 years. In 2001, first-generation VADs were proven far superior to uh, medical management by the REED-MATCH trial, but pulsatile devices were large with durability problems, and it seemed that this was addressed by continuous flow VADs. During the same period, continuous flow VADs would become the new second-generation VADs, and by 2009, continuous flow VADs were confirmed to be far superior to pulsatile devices, and the FDA-approved continuous flow VADs for destination, uh, for bridge to transplant uh, therapy. From an echo perspective, during that uh, second period, LVADs had become steady workflow at a few centers, but by the end of that period, it became a significant work volume at several mechanical circulatory support sites. Uh, the next 
The next era really is still unfolding and began with the FDA approvals of the second generation VAD, which means that LVAD could be implanted uh, for an extended period to save uh, patient, uh, to extend the lives of patients that are not candidates for destination uh, for cardiac transplantation, in other words, approval for destination therapy. And this has led to considerable expansion in the number of implant centers. And from an echo uh, lab perspective, this has become a significant workflow uh, volume issue. And there's a perceived need for, a, in a sense, a how-to manual to establish at least a framework for echo lab workflow when it comes to managing these patients even the absence of robust uh, data for imaging outcomes. So there's an addressed need for improved uh, durability and portability of devices, and this has uh, been shown to have good, uh, improved long and intermediate, short and intermediate term survival, but these continuous flow VADs also introduce a new physiology, which we're just getting uh, used to in a sense. This is an outpatient VAD clinic in 2011. So in some centers, uh, these are the type of days that, that uh, we can have. And the question of when to echo and what to look for and what resources uh, are needed have just been internal discussions at different centers. Uh, but now this is uh, growing to a more uh, national level. Uh, most people that are in echocardiography aren't familiar with the Intermax database which is a registry for mechanical-assisted uh, support devices. Um, it's combined effort of the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, FDA, clinician scientists, and industries. And these are FDA-reported devices, and periodically they report their data, most recently in June of 2014, and actuarial survival among these patients continues to be 80% at one year and 70% at two years. Sorry, that slide wasn't advancing, it should have. This is Intermax data, which shows a remarkable increase in the number of both implant centers and the cumulative number of patients since 2006. And you can see when the HeartMate 2 was approved for destination therapy down there January 2010. The Intermax uh, 6 annual report indicated more than 2,000 continuous flow pumps had been performed annually during 2012 and 2013. And a recent query of the database indicates that current active implant sites have expanded from, 160, from 261 from 141, and that the total number of implants of, as of August the 3rd, 2015, was 16,000. And at this time, the number of LVAD implants annually exceeded the number of heart transplant patients. This data from the ISHLT registry of the inter, of, um, adult and pediatric heart transplant sh uh, patients shows that the annual rates of heart transplantation has been stagnant for the last 25 years due to a limited donor pool. Yet over the last uh, few years only, uh, we're up to over 3,000 LVAD implants annually in North America. And for perspective, um, this seems like a big number, but there are currently in excess of 500,000 patients living with advanced heart failure in the U.S. alone. A recent guideline document from the Mechanical Circulatory Support Community recommends echocardiography at the different stages of LVAD patient management, and it's considered an integral tool, but there's been little guidance for exactly how to and when to do the echocardiogram. So with that background, I am going to delve into the document in some more detail. How did we come about the guidelines? Uh, there's an established need. ECHO was determined to be integral to patient management. And our goals were to establish a, frame rate, a, a, a framework based on LVAD phase of care 
and that the guidelines would harmonize with established clinical guidelines and respect differences between the different mechanical circulatory support internal practice patterns in the absence of validation studies. A main goal was to improve communication between Echolab and mechanical, mechanical circulatory support team members. And of course, to improve patient care was our primary mission. We formed a representative writing committee a formal literature review was conducted, and limited outcomes data to validate standard approaches were available, and this came primarily from the second generation devices with little data available at this time for third generation devices. We internally published and reviewed each center's existing LVAD protocols and procedures, and consensus was established. The recommendations are based upon expert opinion from high-volume advanced heart failure and mechanical circulatory support centers. Periodic guideline document updates will be needed as the field is rapidly changing and as further validation studies are available. For now, however, the document provides relevant practical tools for Echo Labs and educational text, and we've provided uh, worksheets and protocols for laboratories to follow. And part of the main objective of this document is to go through uh, the, the tools that, that labs can obtain from the guideline to evaluate and incorporate into their practice patterns. Guideline contributors include echocardiographers from the adult, pediatric, congenital, CV anesthesia, and sonography community, heart failure specialists without expertise uh, in echocardiography per se. Also, we're on the writing committee, and of course, the reviewers uh, were available. The main focus is on surgically implanted long-term continuous flow left ventricular assist devices. Discussed in brief in the document is BIVAD support and other imaging, imaging modalities. Temporary VAD support, including percutaneous and extracorporeal devices, are discussed in the appendix. And I would recommend that you look at those. If you're at a center that does a lot of implants, these devices are going to be encountered on a daily basis. We do not discuss intraaortic balloon pump, ECMO, RVAD support, or the total artificial heart. Look at the different devices now. The first uh, device approved by the FDA for bridge to transplant and uh, destination therapy that are continuous flow is the HeartMate 2 device. And common to all of these surgically implanted devices is an inflow cannula that exits the left ventricle. This is attached to a mechanical impeller which then goes to an outflow graft, which is seen here with the double arrows. And this is the part that can be imaged by echocardiography from parasternal windows. There's an outflow graft to an aorta anastomosis, indicated by the black arrow. And the image on the right is a CT scout image, so that you can see the device position relative to the body. And notice that this second generation device also has uh, the traditional battery packs, a controller, which uh, is connected to the um, impeller and supplies power and also receives data from the device and generates alarms. In this uh, particular uh, device, the second generation is an axial flow pump, which is based on the Archimedes screw uh, principle, and it's capable of operating in the 6,000 to 15,000 RPM range, but the practical operating range is 8,800 to 10,000 RPMs. And for changing speeds, this is done in increments of usually 200, but sometimes 400 RPMs. The HVAD is actually a third generation device that's approved for bridge to trans, uh, Bridge to transplantation currently, it looks very similar. It operates at lower RPM speeds. And this is a third generation device because unlike the axial flow pump, there's no physical mounting of the impeller. This is a centrifugal 
uh, flow device, the disc is magnetically suspended, and so there's no mechanical contact. And this has implications with regards to the physiology of the device, uh, how it's able to impel the blood, and also uh, durability there's, since there's no contact. It's also smaller. The HeartMate 2 device is below the diaphragm, and this device is miniaturized and actually is implanted inside the pericardium uh, with the inflow uh, can, uh, cannula attached to the impeller. So let's look at the ECHO protocols that are defined uh, by phases of care. There's a pre-implantation uh, examination that's recommended, perioperative imaging, LVAD surveillance examination after implantation, with or without an LVAD optimization exam, an LVAD problem-focused exam, an LVAD recovery exam. The protocols are discussed within the document in this order, and the rest of the talk really is going to be just kind of walking you through the document. We've started with an introduction and already in a discussion of the, the, the two major devices that we're going to be um, talking about. In the body of the document, uh, we go through these, but also the dotted lines point to items that are in the appendix, which are tools that labs can use, uh, copy these, tear them out, or adapt them uh, to um, your, your needs or your internal standards at the implant center. I'd also like to um, point out that um, the document is 55 pages long because of a lot of the different areas that we cover, but I think it's useful to use the table of contents because if you're interested in a, a, a phase of care, a particular problem, then we've tried to make these relatively concise and you can flip through to them without having to uh, spend too much time weeding through the document. Pre-implantation, uh, transesophageal echo, or TE when needed, is crucial for optimal candidate selection. First-line imaging modality surface echo uh, it's used to detect and confirm systolic dysfunction, to screen for relative or absolute contraindications. TE may be required for emergent or uh, studies, you know, when, when the patient's in cardiogenic shock and a good surface echo can't be uh, done expediently. An inadequate TE would, a surface echo would be another reason to perform a TE. Performance supervision and interpretation should be done by echocardiographers and sonographers who are experienced in advanced heart failure and hemodynamic assessment of mechanical circulatory support uh, devices. The exam protocol uh, in this uh, pre-implantation exam really consists of the comprehensive heart failure examination that's already well defined uh, by the American Society of Echocardiography with special attention to high risk or red flag findings. And so these high risk or red flag, flag findings prior to implant are what the document really wants to point out, not how to go through a detailed heart failure examination, which should already be familiar to the lab. The new views really consist mainly of just a visualization of, um, see that's actually post. So the, the, a table that's in the document which is useful and is too small to be read in detail here is the pre-implantation echo red flag findings. So I think this is kind of a helpful uh, little table you could tape to a machine even to realize that uh, the things shown on the right are, are problems that uh, should really receive careful attention if LVAD is being considered, and the most important of these are the presence of RV dysfunction and, my, and greater than mild aortic regurgitation. I'd like to go through these in some detail with you. This is a pre-implantation protocol uh, with red flag findings embedded so that as you work through the standard protocol, 
you would just be aware of things that might really um, be red flags and should require further investigation prior to considering LVAD and things that you might want to bring to the attention of this, either the um, heart failure doctor or the, or the surgeon. For pre-LVAD pre assessment, dilated cardiomyopathy with severe LV systolic dysfunction characterizes the majority of LVAD recipients, so labs must be proficient in measuring LV size, ejection fraction, and cardiac output. Details regarding this are published in separate ASC guidelines. Microbubble contrast may be needed for accuracy and to, to exclude thrombus. Pre-implantation assessment of RV function is a very large topic. It's, considered, it's uh, received considerable attention. And there's a lot of research in this area. Patients with RV failure or severe RV dysfunction prior to LVAD implantation have a much worse prognosis. It's been shown that their survival may be improved if BIVAD support is initiated at the time of initial surgery rather than later. Echo signs of RV dysfunction include impaired systolic function, RV dilatation, and other secondary surrogates of RV dysfunction, including high right atrial pressure and significant uh, TR. The guideline does not go into great detail uh, regarding this. The RV size function and hemodynamics assessment uh, is uh, separately published in other ASC guidelines in detail. However, we recommend that quantitative measures be at attempted when able to be properly measured. Echo parameters or surrogates of RV dysfunction should not be considered in isolation. Is the clinical syndrome of our right-sided heart failure present by other parameters? It's a huge question that has to be correlated with the echo data, and the literature does not currently support the use of any single echo parameter for predicting post-LVAD prognosis or the need for biventricular support. Labs must be proficient in assessing the full spectrum of valve pathology, including the potential difficulties of prosthetic valve assessment and the assessment of valve stenosis and regurgitation lesions in the setting of poor imaging conditions or low cardiac output states. Advanced TEE proficiency should be available when surface echo is inadequate or inconclusive. Separate ASD publications address these, uh, det and these issues in detail. When it comes to assessment of valve disease, uh, it's interesting to note that aortic stenosis may be acceptable, although it's not ideal. Mitral stenosis that's greater than moderate is unacceptable, and any, um, any valve lesion that uh, impedes forward flow before the aortic valve is going to be a relatively contra uh, a relative contraindication to uh, LVAD implantation if not addressed. It's important to note that greater than mild aortic regurgitation is unacceptable because this can create a blind loop of flow. It can be accentuated after LVAD implantation, and it can be continuous, so the regurgitant volume can go up. And also, it tends to, forget, to progress over time. And more than moderate tricuspid regurgitation, of course, is an ominous sign because it may reflect RV dysfunction. When it comes to aortic regurgitation, um, surgical correction at the time of LVAD implantation is usually recommended if it's significant. And over sewing of the native valve can be done, although there's no fail safe opening if that uh, is uh, done. Should the device fail or if there's patient recovery, a bioprosthesis can be placed and also a central coaptation stitch, although few candidates, patients are candidates for this. I think this is pertinent to know in patients that have had LVADs, uh, you know, what, what may have gone on in surgery and what its echo appearance may look like. This is actually a patient that's had uh, an echo on the upper left that had more than um, mild aortic regurgitation. It was central, and the leaflets were relatively normal. And so this patient underwent 
a central coaptation stitch. And so you can see in B, there's a thickening here, there's a stitch. And the interesting thing about this repair is that it corrected the aortic regurgitation, but as shown on the M mode, there's opening of the aortic valve in the commissural areas so that, that there's treatment of AI. Also, there's some ability to open the aortic valve. See this playing. Okay, now I'd like to conduct a pop quiz for you. Thanks for um, enduring some of these recommendations <laughs> by the list. The first question is, which set of terms best describe the three LVAD components in series, common to both the HeartMate 2 and the HVAD? And I'm going to give you a few seconds to read this and to answer. The answer is B, and I'd say um, most people got the right answer. From the prior pictures, you see uh, the, the series and connection are the inflow cannula, impeller, and outflow graft. And the reason this was important to address specifically is in the literature, there have been a lot of different names used for the inflow cannula and for the outflow graft. The part that we image on echocardiography, the inflow cannula and the outflow graft, um, is important. I think that if we are speaking the same language, then that can facilitate communication. Here's the uh, inflow cannula with the red arrow pointing to that. So these, this could be imaged from parasternal and apical views generally for uh, two-dimensional and Doppler imaging. The impeller device shown with this red arrow is, cannot actually be seen with echocardiography. It's outside the uh, heart. And then the outflow graph shown with this red arrow. Question two, which one of the following is not one of the recommended phase of care protocols for LVAD echo exams? Okay, it looks like um, Yep, most people got this one right, too, although there's a lot of spread. 12% uh, on the first one, 27% for LVAD surveillance, LVAD optimization. Perioperative recovery exam is the answer. This is not an exam that's recommended. Uh, rarely would you try to um, look at recovery already in the operating room. Uh, let's see here. So this is the, you know, the first real introduction to the exam and no perioperative recovery exam, but pre-implantation, very important. Perioperative imaging, very critical. And then afterwards, surveillance echo, an optimization exam, problem focus exam, and recovery. And I'm gonna go through these in detail, and I'm sure by the end, you'd get 100%. Okay, quiz is over. Back to the top. So let's look at the pre-implantation echo in other populations. There, there is um, some data suggesting that in patients with small hearts who are adult, there's a, there's a poor outcome. We don't have as much information on these patients, but a red flag really is someone with a small heart who could have restrictive cardiomyopathy or infiltrative cardiomyopathy. And so it's very important to really look at the size and stroke volume of the ventricles. Uh, also, small people, cardiac or adolescent or small adults could fit into this category, even if they don't have a, cardi a restrictive cardiomyopathy, but there may be a, more of a tendency to obstruct the inflow cannula. Patients with congenital heart disease may be candidates, but there's much less known. This is a growing population, and there is a new PDMAX registry. And so I think this is an area we're going to learn a lot more about, but the numbers are smaller, and we... Uh, uh, we'll be watching this area. For now, dilated cardiomyopathies with low ejection fractions are going to be the majority of our patients. Let's look at perioperative TE. Prior guidelines to discuss TE imaging techniques is, is, um, has been published and updated recently, and these references are in the text. Training requirements, uh, we recommend that um, it, that cardiovascular anesthesiologists performing this procedure have advanced perioperative TE training, and that cardiologists 
going to the operating room to do these studies have advanced TEE and perioperative cardiovascular imaging experience. The pre-implantation imaging, TEE imaging in the operating room should be comprehensive with the knowledge that in the case of an urgent or emergent LVAD, this may be the only primary screening exam, so critical. And also there could be previously undiagnosed, underappreciated, or new findings that weren't apparent on, on prior studies. After the device is implanted, an immediate post-implantation exam is critical, and I'll discuss the, uh, the details of that, and then again, after a period of stabilization, making sure that, that everything is in order. As a tool, we've included a perioperative TE protocol or work list. This is not really a detailed protocol because, as I said, protocols are published elsewhere, but this checklist goes through what would be considered red flag findings at the time of a pre-LVAD study. And some examples of these are really paying special attention to the degree of aortic regurgitation and to consider vasopressor agents if blood pressure is low and to bring out aortic regurgitation. Um, PFO detection is critical. PFOs can be missed all the way up until the time that um, the patient's coming off the pump and LVAD is initiated because of the one-way uh, valve, a ton the tunnel PFOs can present as. So this is a, a special area of consideration that's talked about more in the document. And also RV dysfunction. This is the last chance to really see if the patient's got severe RV dysfunction before the device goes in. And immediately after the VAD is implanted, the TE is used to assist with de-airing maneuvers, immediate assessment for unmasked PFO, uh, LVAD suction events can occur. The study is used to really look carefully for cannula inflow position and to screen for obstruction using Doppler, reassess for aortic valve regurgitation, the degree of aortic regurg uh, opening, and also RV size and function assessment of that with septal positioning uh, analysis, relook at tricuspid regurg regurgitation. And many times the uh, aorta to outflow, the outflow graft to aorta anastomosis can really be seen in the operating room. And we encourage people to try to image that routinely. This is an example of a PFO that's unmasked immediately after the patient had activation of the LVAD and had to go back on pump for closure. <clears throat> These are images in the operating room, and you can see the value of using a simultaneous orthogonal plane imaging for assessing the position of the cannula, uh, being able to find exactly the orientation of the valve opening. And the three-dimensional image on the right, I think, is useful as showing this neutral ventricular septal uh, motion. Uh, that's a sign of good, RVAD, uh, good LVAD support. The pump is unloading the left ventricle sufficiently so that there's not continuous left to right bowing of the interventricular septum. The right ventricle is handling the forward flow so it's not dilating and causing right to left uh, bowing of the interventricular septum. So this one's just right. We've got sort of a balanced interventricular septal position and unobstructed cannula flow. Here's another patient Right after LVAD implantation, you can see with color Doppler uh, laminar inflow. The um, cannula position velocities are shown to be acceptable in this case. The pulse Doppler shows a peak systolic and what we'd call a nadir diastolic velocity. Continuous Doppler to screen for obstruction shows a normal hybrid signal. And I think it's important to kind of realize the fact that when you do CW, you can't really see that laminar flow anymore, but you can have overlying mitral inflow velocities um, or aortic inflow velocities. And so note that the cannula velocities uh, greater than 1.5 and certainly two meters per second are considered abnormal and might warrant uh, separate consideration. And with the HVAD device, it's really not possible to, to see the spectral Doppler, the inflow, but cannula position 
can be seen. This is an example of significant aortic regurgitation after uh, activation of the LVAD, and I think this shows pretty graphically this blind loop of flow that can occur. Aortic regurgitation is drawn into the LVAD, is pumped out to the aorta, and then right back down through the LVAD, so this causes significant volume loading of the ventricle without as much augmented forward flow as you would like. This is a view of the out, the outflow graph to aorta anastomosis using simultaneous orthogonal plane imaging at the level of the right pulmonary artery. It's very easy to see this in the majority of patients. In my experience, uh, if you come up and get this view, which is sometimes omitted, but it can be very helpful and guarantee that you've got a nice laminar flow at this site uh, when the patient leaves the operating room. And again, this is Doppler of the outflow graph to ascending aorta anastomosis with nice uh, laminar looking uh, pulse Doppler flow on the left with uh, peak systolic and nadir diastolic velocity. And we were even able to get a 3D image of the on view of the anastomosis in this case and screened uh, for obstruction too with, with CW. And it's pertinent to realize that the outflow graft uh, can be imaged along the um, right ventricle and right atrium in many cases. If you get a four-chamber, a modified four-chamber view, then simultaneous orthogonal imaging can, can really lay out the outflow graph for you, and sometimes this can even be uh, uh, interrogated with pulse Doppler. I'll, I'll say this isn't always the case, but when uh, it can be obtained, can be uh, provide very useful um, supplementary information. I just showed you um, some, some images in the operating room of the outflow graft to aorta anastomosis. And, and this is another um, image immediately after the patient had activation of the LVAD. And this shows an abduction event in the operating room diagnosed uh, perioperatively. And if you look at the example on the left, the ventricle is very small and stuck down. And there's uh, obviously obstruction of the cannula. The, the inflow cannula is at the tip of this uh, black arrow on the left and very small cavity size. But notice that this is at, actually at a relatively um, uh, at, at normal pump speed. And, and what, what happened was just realization in the operating room that uh, this was occurring, and the pump speed was turned down just a little bit. And in this case, a suction event was created by hypovolemia and low afterload. So with vasopressors and fluid and just turning the pump down a little bit, you can see uh, the heart recovered very quickly. So um, this is sort of a dynamic situation in the operating room sometimes, so this back and forth a little bit between uh, whoever's operating the pump speed and CV anesthesia is necessary. And so this suction event wasn't because of RV failure, which can be another cause, because on the right-hand screen, you can see the ventricles uh, small and, and filling well, and the problem was relatively quickly corrected. This shows uh, imaging of the HVAD in the operating room. Now, it has a particular spectral Doppler artifact. Uh, Two-dimensional imaging is possible, but it's not possible to actually get the flow inside the inflow cannula. But if you can adjust your imaging plane into any plane that doesn't include the inflow cannula, your other two-dimensional color and spectral Doppler imaging can be performed. So pop quiz. Which of the pre-implant echo findings is most likely to be deleterious to LVAD outcome if not addressed? Moderate to severe functional MR, mild to moderate TR, moderate AR, LV ejection fraction less than 15%, mild to moderate mitral stenosis. So I'll give you a few um, seconds to answer this. All right, we had an excellent, excellent response to that. Uh, moderate AR, AR, I think that, that vivid image helped. Uh, AR is, is really something that can uh, cause problems with these devices, and whereas the other, the other things are not such huge issues. And again, the answer is found in our red flag findings. So if you can study this in detail, significant MR actually is pretty well tolerated and may improve post-LVAD surgery. So I encourage you guys to really study the valve section of this document. 
Let's go on to surveillance echo exam, which is indicated when uh, the course is uncomplicated, there are no alarms, no abnormal clinical signs or symptoms. And this can be useful to establish baseline patient-specific parameters and to detect a cult abnormality. Sometimes these patients are doing well, there's no alarms, but some things can be brewing, such as de novo AR that forms uh, during the course of LVAD support, particularly if the aortic valve is an opening, smoldering heart failure in inactive patients, and early pump malfunction. And we've recommended that an, a, a program for periodic LVAD uh, surveillance be undertaken in your lab. And this is an example of a schedule that you may uh, incorporate and might correspond with some of the other uh, housekeeping things that you do for your patients and be very clinically useful also. And this is a um, surveillance echo exam protocol. This doesn't involve any pump speeds, but we are looking at certain things. Uh, you know, really doing a, a, a regular heart failure examination at whatever the patient's baseline pump speed, but with special attention to things that can happen after LVAD implantation. They're listed here. And also uh, just looking at the special views of the inflow cannula and the outflow graft, and if possible, the outflow graft anastomosis. And the actual detailed optimization protocol can be customized uh, for the, pay, for the uh, implant center's uh, internal standards at this point. There's not a lot of outcomes data on the use of surveillance uh, protocols, but we, we feel that they're, they're important. Another issue I want to bring up is that of blood pressure. It's important to record this on the worksheet. Blood pressure really reflects LVAD uh, and L, native LV afterload and can strongly influence the amount and interpretation of different things such as AR, LV size, aortic valve opening, mitral regurge, and actually the, the amount of flow through the aortic valve. And it can be a tricky to obtain a blood pressure in patients that have continuous flow and no pulse. So we can use uh, a, an arterial Doppler exam, which would correspond to a mean pressure, and your support uh, teams often provide these. You can look at the art line, and if the patient has aortic valve opening and a pulse, then you can get a standard uh, blood pressure reading. Uh, this can be a safety issue because patients can become hypertensive with increased pump speeds or hypotensive, particularly on turndowns. The aortic valve imaging is important after these devices, and M mode can be used for looking at the duration uh, and degree of opening and the frequency of opening of the aortic valve, which uh, certainly can vary in these patients. And this is an example of aortic valve opening at different speeds in the same patient. And so you may need a slower sweep speed to capture enough um, beats to see if the valve is opening uh, intermittently or not. If some of your um, speed change parameters are influenced by the degree of aortic valve opening, then it's important to realize this caveat that you can have exaggerated or false aortic valve opening and these valves that barely open, the um, sort of semilunar nature of the aortic cusp can give you the appearance that the valve's opening when it's really not opening. So that's something to keep in mind. This is an illustration of de novo aortic valve uh, regurgitation. The patient had essentially no aortic regurgitation at the implant uh, date, but a month later there was some trivial AR, but at 14 months he had actually developed significant aortic regurgitation in this patient that didn't have any previously. When looking at the uh, post-implant echo, the LV size uh, measurement's important. This is a patient that had an increase in the left ventricular size after being at a pump speed um, prolonged for a certain period of time. And also notice that the aortic valve opening duration by M mode increased quite a bit. And this is uh, pathognomonic of a patient that actually had developed uh, internal prompt, uh, pump thrombosis. When it comes to looking at left ventricular size, we recommend the left ventricular uh, uh, internal diameter uh, measurement because it's very reproducible, although it is usually is going to underestimate your LV size. Uh, we recommend, when possible, the Simpson's biplane or single plane method uh, when it's available with these newer devices, uh, I think the imaging windows can often be very, um, very adequate, as you can see here. 
Uh, when it comes to left ventricular ejection fraction, this is assumed abnormal, and in fact, this isn't particularly useful during continuous LVAD support. Uh, so we don't go to great extremes to report the left ventricular ejection fraction, except in the setting of the recovery assessment, in which case it can be very helpful. This is normal uh, uh, flow on the HeartMate 2 inflow cannula using pulsed and spectral Doppler. Also want to show you this other normal inflow cannula Doppler flow. This one's just a little more complicated, though, because the patient had a mitral valve repair and this septal interaction with the cannula tips creating just a little bit of flow. And so you've got this normal variant hybrid Doppler. It's not as pretty, but sometimes uh, this, this is not something to be too alarmed about as long as the flow velocities are not elevated. This is inflow cannula artifact in an HVAD patient, and so it's impossible to directly measure the flow in an HVAD inflow cannula. However, a lot of other uh, aspects of the exam can be used uh, for us to indirectly assess how the HVAD is functioning using Doppler. And this is an example of a right parasternal uh, view of the outflow graft, and many times it's possible to Doppler uh, interrogate the outflow graft and show laminar flow pattern, which in this case actually changes as the pump speed is increased. You see much more of a phasic pulsatile looking flow at the uh, pump speed of 8,600 RPM. And as the pump speed is increased, there's an increasing diastolic velocity and a decreased systolic uh, component, a normal response. Although we aren't always able to get such a pretty image, I think it's worthwhile noting that many times if you come up uh, higher in the right peristernal view, you can get uh, pretty coaxial windows on the outflow graph to aorta anastomosis. And it is possible uh, when these types of images are available to calculate uh, directly the amount of flow through the outflow graph. So I'd like for you to study this image. And this type of detailed more, um, you know, this is not for routine uh, imaging, I would say, but I think practicing this can be very helpful when you have those patients where you're literally trying to decide whether the ex to explant the device or not, high, high risk uh, type situation. Also very useful is the ability to calculate the total cardiac output using the stroke volume through the right ventricular outflow tract. And this is a, a standard measurement that you should be doing already in most of your labs. Diastolic dysfunction is an issue that's frequently discussed, is presumed severely abnormal, but the applicability and the interpretation of standard diastolic parameters during continuous LVAD unloading is uncertain. There's no data correlating diastolic parameters with outcomes. Many of these data should probably should be collected because they can be very useful when clinically tracking an individual patient, particularly the mitral E velocity. These are an example of mitral E velocity at different pump speeds, and as the pump is turned up, the E velocity uh, goes down because of improved uh, unloading of the left ventricle. So these patients with smoldering heart failure that are inactive, this can be very helpful in you know, potentially adjusting the pump speed and, and also in patients that have uh, subtle symptoms, maybe improving their heart failure, maybe a sign that they are under unloaded. Let's look at the LVAD optimization exam. Uh, these indications, um, these are indicated when there are no alarms, there's an uncomplicated course, and there's no clinical signs or symptoms. Um, it's part of a surveillance exam when indicated by a center's internal standards. For example, if you're doing a surveillance exam and there have been a drift from the criteria that, that, that your lab would like to see for optimal pump speeds, then an optimization study can be added on. Uh, the definition of optimal speed varies among centers, but there's a consensus that the optimal speed lies between a minimum and a maximum speed. The data collection is, occurs after incremental pump speed changes. A minimum speed is the speed below which uh, you start to see increased LV size. The ventricular septum may be shifted rightward because of uh, inadequate LV unloading. 
the aortic valve may open more frequently or are more sustained, and there can be increases in the, in the uh, uh, heart failure findings um, below uh, the minimum speed. The maximum speed would be uh, above that speed, ventricular septum might shift leftward, and this may be because the, the uh, RV is becoming dilated, the ventricles being sucked down in the septal or other myocardial tissue can actually impede the cannula inflow. Bicuspid regurgitation may worsen from uh, RV uh, insufficiency and also distortion of the tricuspid valve annulus because of septal uh, motion changes. The aortic valve ceases opening if it was previously opening. Aortic regurgitation can increase when it's present. And there's also the possibility for hypertension or if there's too much obstruction, hypotension. And some or all of these may constitute a suction, what's called a suction event. This is uh, an optimization uh, ramp protocol. So this is um, something that's within the document. This is essentially a comprehensive uh, heart failure exam at the baseline uh, uh, speed. And then incremental speed changes, which are detailed in this worksheet, are conducted with safety endpoints and study endpoints in mind. I think it's important to realize that the lab um, is, is, uh, is unable to conduct a comprehensive exam at each speed, but we've provided a table here that can be used for either LVAD optimization or for problem-focused exam uh, studies whereby uh, you really perform a limited exam at the different pump speeds uh, after a period of stabilization. And this can be tailored quite a bit according to the problem at hand or what the lab would like to have in its database for uh, standard uh, pro, uh, baseline uh, parameters for each patient. The next protocol is the LVAD problem-focused exam. This is indicated when there's any suggestion of abnormal device or native heart function, and that would include alarms, recurrent heart failure, abnormal serology, fever, stroke. This could also include an abnormal surveillance exam when there were clinical, uh, subclinical findings to try to um, va validate those findings. These are some LVAD complications in their echocardiography appearance, and there's a laundry list here of pericardial effusion, LV failure, RV failure, suction events, significant AR, bad related MR, intracardiac thrombus, inflow cannula and outflow graft abnormalities, hypertensive emergency, and pump function, uh, mal pump malfunction. So I'd encourage you to go through this sheet. I'd also like to note that a comprehensive LVAD uh, exam just at the baseline speed may be sufficient for a diagnosis, particularly if there are changes from the prior exam, but a speed change or a ramp study may be required. Again, this is the problem-focused ramp protocol, which is the same as our optimization protocol, but with just uh, different caveats for indication. Again, the worksheet for the LVAD optimization and the protocol, the problem-focused exam are the same. Aortic regurgitation by surface echo. This is something that can be evaluated. This is an example of aortic root thrombus by transesophageal echocardiography. And this is a patient that had uh, continuously closed aortic valve, progressive aortic regurgitation, and many different um, images to support the fact that there's this blind loop of flow with very prominent aortic graft to aorta anastomosis flow there on the right-hand side. In a patient with impeller thrombosis, after uh, comparison with the patient's prior imaging, the left ventricle was much larger by diastole by uh, dimension, the aortic valve is opening more. And you can see nice laminar flow on the left side, but very reduced flow by color Doppler pulsed 
and spectral Doppler on the right side. Now let's look at suction event, which is related to persistent RV failure. This is extremely important. This is a suction event uh, not that long after a patient was in CV recovery, and you can see the left to right bowing of the the right to left bowing of the interatrial septum there on the left side, and a visible obstruction of the inflow cannula with spikes in the inflow velocity greater than three meters per second. And this is flow in the outflow graft to aorta, aorta anastomosis and the upper panels, which is very irregular, and the dysclassic pattern at the left of a dilated right ventricle, severe TR, and persistent right to left bowing of the interventricular septum. And this patient uh, had this happen at a low pump speed, very indicative of RV failure, and so biventricular support was instituted. The next case is a suction event related to persistent hypovolemia in a patient that had normal VAD function at uh, a relatively high pump speed, but then developed gastrointestinal illness, became hypovolemic, and so the left ventricle was sucked down. There was mechanical ventricular tachycardia, increased velocities in the inflow cannula, and this was treated very quickly uh, after the echocardiogram confirmed this. The pump speed was turned down. The left ventricle got larger. The patient was given some fluid. In this case, uh, simple measures resolved the situation. This second case also brings up the point of having a safety margin in patients where we're determining the minimum and the maximum pump speed. You would like to have a bracket of safety in there. Finally, this is a patient with tamponade that was treated inappropriately for RV failure, which can have similar appearance by other criteria. But when looking at the echocardiogram, the right ventricle is small, and there's a very large pericardial effusion. A case of outflow graft to an aorta anastomosis actually incidentally detected in this patient just because we uh, made the effort to get the view. And in this case, this is an, a, a transesophageal echo in a patient with severe uh, outflow graft to aorta stenosis. Uh, and this was detected incidentally at the time of an endocarditis workup a year after the implant. And this device had to be removed, and it actually was uh, found that this kink was due to an errant suture. And so it actually been present uh, at the time of initial implantation. If we look at the recovery exam, we're almost towards the end. I know we're running over just a little bit, and I appreciate people staying on, but um, the recovery exam indication is that a small percentage of patients may recover LV sufficiently to consider device removal. And so what is a strategy that we can use to verify that they would be okay for removal of the pump? It's important to note that at very low pump speeds, net neutral or reverse LVAD flow can occur. Even with the device spinning at a certain low rate, there's enough afterload that you can have cessation of blood flow in the system. And so this creates a high risk situation for device internal thrombosis. So verification of therapeutic anticoagulation therapy is critical. In these recovery exams, quantitation of left ventricular ejection fraction is needed, and of course, monitoring for symptoms of low output, including hypotension, recurrent heart failure. And usually with this protocol, exercise is a component of the recovery exam. This is a, an example of a patient with diastolic reverse flow in a situation of, of LV recovery. Of note, this can also happen if there's cessation of, of impeller motion. Uh, you can get diastolic flow reversal, and so this is, it's kind of important to be familiar with this um, in case the device just isn't working and you see this pattern. So as a pop quiz, after LVAD implantation, which of the following is not expected to occur during a suction event? We're very close to the end. Small underfilled LV, a dilated RV, possible inflow cannula obstruction, left to right ventricular septal shift, worsening TR, right to left ventricular septal shift. 
most people said left to right ventricular septal shift, and this is this is the right answer. And I'm just going to show you that you know this is something to look at. And if you really keep these in your lab, I think your your personnel is going to be aware of this very critical uh, finding suction events and being aware of ventricular septal position and correlating that with your findings. This is in the sonographer LVAT exam checklist or ordering worksheet. Septal position also appears in the perioperative TE protocol and checklist. Also in the LVAD complications and echo appearance document. The quiz is over. I'd just like to wrap it up. This is a sonographer LVAD exam checklist and ordering worksheet. I think it's it's a nice thing to just, you get that LVAD echo request, pull this out and just kind of quick check that you know why the exam's being ordered it, who's ordering it, in case we need to talk to them, the type of LVAD that's implanted and what's the date, and also the device speed and um, device type should be annotated on the screen when you're doing these exams and changed if the speed change is made. Blood pressure is critical. Uh, can't emphasize that enough. If there's an alarm type, if any, that's, that's really important to know. I'm not going to go over alarms in this presentation, unfortunately, due to time limitations, but I really encourage you to read about alarms because that can really inform what your differential diagnosis might be before you even start the study, what are pertinent clinical symptoms, and who's the designated person in charge of, of changing this pump speed. I mean, that's not something that's really addressed uh, formally in many centers, and who's the appropriate uh, person supervising the study and somebody that would be capable of recognizing important endpoints. And I'd like to point out I haven't gone over this in detail already, but the aortic root thrombus is very important. If you've got aortic root thrombus, it could form in patients with continually closed uh, aortic valves. When you turn the pump speed down, the aortic valve could suddenly open, so there's an embolic risk. So we've gone over uh, introduction. We've talked about the new devices and the protocols and the tools that we have and as a homework assignment, I think I would really, I hope this has encouraged you to look at the document in detail, read about alarms. Uh, there's more discussion on pediatric and congenital disease. And in the appendix, uh, there's, there's some concise, I think, helpful discussion on percutaneous fads. And those are, those are devices we're seeing more of. And it can be very helpful just to look at those images, understand more and also the extracorporeal devices are, are still used, and even pusher device uh, plate devices, the Berlin heart and pediatric populations, and reading a little bit about uh, right ventricular support. I will um, say that we ran over a little bit. I'm very sorry for that. The, there are quite a number of questions here, and I really am going to reach out to you and see if uh, we can uh, get these uh, answers back in some way. Uh, this concludes our, our program, and I want to thank you very much for, for tuning in and hope that you'll be able to read through the guidelines document in detail with a, in a little bit more uh, informed way and not get uh, uh, sidetracked by the uh, uh, some of the details. Thank you very much.